I actually consider it a privilege and an honor to introduce uh, Officer Dale Hansen. Before we had the names we have today in law enforcement and in criminal justice for the protection of youth and children, um, you know, some of you have mentioned being at other seminars and educational experiences. And I just want to say that the progress in the work that we have today in protecting children against these crimes of sexual exploitation were all built off of this first brick right here. So before we had you know, names and before we had seminars, he was already buried in Minneapolis working for the protection of children in forensic examination. So where we're at today, we do have to give honor to the first laid brick of Officer Dale Hand. And I knew I was going to embarrass him and he's over here. So, but I, it, it had to be done before Minneapolis had a unit to address juvenile sex trafficking. I was an undercover narcotics cop. We didn't know about these laws. Uh, it was actually the beginning of even getting a Minnesota law. So that's how uh, fresh and new the situation was. And I had juvenile, uh, I had juveniles, I had teens as young as 12 years old. Um, I had a case of you know pornography of an infant, and I had nowhere to go except for. Dale Hansen and a sex crimes investigator at the time. So that's how long he's been in it to win it. So without further ado, Officer Dale Hansen. I'm going to talk about a couple of different task forces that I'm involved with. The first one that Jessica mentioned was the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. The task force has actually started in, I think it was 99 or 2000, and has kind of gradually grown. Uh, it's now, there's 61 task forces around the United States. Uh, some states have more, uh, multiple task forces like Florida and California just because of the population sizes. Um, our task force in Minnesota has been going since about 2001, I think. Um, it's, it's all grant funded through the uh, Department of Justice. And uh, at least here in Minnesota, it started off with St. Paul running the uh, program and then it's uh, gradually transitioned to the, uh, to the BCA, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Now, I um, mentioned the, the DOJ funds the task force. Uh, they basically get, annually give 320000 to the task force. Um, in my eyes, my personal opinion here, it's a low amount of money for what, for the, what the problem is, and I'll, I'll show you what the problem is here as we, as we get into it here. But um, I will say that the state has provided more funding to the BCA, giving them more agents um, to, to uh, help combat this problem, but there's, it's just never enough. And at this point, uh, what happens with the, with the BCA and with the task force, uh, agencies sign on to be members of the task force, basically saying that they will work any cases that come into their jurisdiction. And right now there's about 90 different agencies around Minnesota that are, that are signed up. Obviously some are busier than others. If you work way up in northern Minnesota, say up in Beltrami County, you probably don't get more than one case a year. But um, as long as you're willing to work it, that's the important part. Now the, the BCA, um, initially when they first took over the task force, they had three agents. So since then they've actually increased it to around 10 agents at this point. And uh, those agents work statewide. They cover different uh, areas of the state. Uh, they, they have the extra added duty of, of dealing with the predatory offender cases too. And that's gonna be people who are typically not non-compliant uh, sex offenders. who are just gonna be, you know, they're not, uh, they're not registering like they should. So they're always trying to track down those people and. I think that's usually at least, there's usually at least 100 non-compliant at any time, I think. That's probably a low number, I would, I would say. And then they've, uh, they've been adding more forensic examiners. Um, in these cases, the, the forensic examination is always where things uh, slow down. Because if I go into a house and I do a search warrant, uh, I may take uh, five computers, a uh, number of different uh, loose hard drives, I can get into the terabytes of data. If you're not really familiar with data sizes, terabytes are they're huge. You can store you can store easily a million uh, videos and images within one terabyte. Uh, in fact, right now I'm working on a case uh, helping uh, the Plymouth Police Department. Uh, I think we took actually I think they took I think it was three computers and then two uh, they're called network attached storage devices. So in total, it's going to be about uh, about 30 terabytes of data right there. And I've uh, just started to process all that, and it's going to take weeks and weeks to get that start, get going on that. And then uh, the other task force is the FBI Child Exploitation Task Force. It's 
I've been involved with this one for the last seven years. Um, the FBI likes to move the uh, task force around to different uh, units within, the, within uh, the FBI. Right now, this is currently assigned to a white collar crime unit, so there's kind of a, a hodgepodge of investigations going on within there. Uh, I work with primarily with two other special agents who have been uh, doing this for about the same amount of time I have. And uh, we're actually bringing another, um, I, actually my, my, uh, my role is called a task force officer there. Uh, so I'm basically deputized the same as a, an FBI agent. We're actually bringing another agent in, or actually another officer from St. Paul. She'll be joining us soon to uh, help work these cases. And then uh, FBI, they also have a, a team of forensic examiners too that, that, uh, that help process all the, all the data that comes in from these cases. Now, uh, where do we get these cases from? Uh, some, uh, some people, they conduct, or some of the uh, officers or, or, or agents, they conduct uh, chat investigations. Uh, that, that area has kind of gone down a little bit. There isn't as much of that going on. Uh, it's actually the, the second line there, the, the online ads, the, the back pages, the, that sort of thing that happened with the, with recently with the uh, Super Bowl coming in. That's where, uh, that's where a lot of this has moved to. It's, and things move really fast in those investigations. You know, an ad's put out there for a teenage girl. The ads are answered within minutes, and a lot of a lot of answers come through there. Then uh, the third one down. That's 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 what I've been doing a lot uh, actually since 2005. I, I have uh, specific programs that have been customized for law enforcement that just spend the program spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, just trolling the internet looking for anyone. And I focus on Minnesota, but it looks for anyone who's uh, who's distributing child pornography online. And uh, I have a number of different programs running. I have both in my office in Minneapolis and also at the FBI office. And um, I generate more cases than I can possibly even work, unfortunately. There's, there's so much of it out there. Um, and then uh, the, the fourth line down, the NECMEC, and NECMEC is that's the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They receive uh, tips from uh, Google, uh, uh, let's say Dropbox, all, all these different online providers, once they detect that there's uh, some sort of child exploitation event going on, they refer to the National Center, who then determine what state it's in, and then they refer it to us. You know, if it comes into Minnesota and it ends up being Minneapolis, I get the case. And then uh, occasionally get, uh, other, you know, get other lead cases from other agencies. Um, like I just got one through the FBI, it ended up being a guy in Minneapolis. They, you know, they had a case started. The guy was actually, he had actually uh, received some child pornography in the case. So I'm, I'm working that at, at, uh, case right now. And then uh, not that we get them very much, but there, there are sometimes you get the 911 calls where, like, in, you know, for instance, in Minneapolis, some officers went to a burglary call. They go inside the house. Uh, the, the, the guy's not there. The, the homeowner's not there. But they walk around the house, and they see all these printed pictures computers uh, up and going with that on it. So instantly right there, we have a new case. So with all these different uh, sources here, we stay very, very busy. And big question, how bad is the problem in Minnesota? So uh, a couple of days ago, I went on to one of the systems that uh, keeps track of, there's five different networks that we monitor that uh, where uh, child pornography is being distributed. So this is uh, just in the last 14 days. That's what that, that's what that network, you know, all these monitors have, uh, or these uh, programs have monitored. So that's all over the state there. You know. And those, you know, at those, these, this point, this is all rough locations. It's, it's based on the, the IP address of the computer. So it's, it's a rough location where it is. We can obviously, with any of those cases, we can find out an exact location just with a little bit of legal paperwork. So, um, and in Minneapolis right now, I have about uh, 15 search warrants I can do right now. I have enough probable cause to do the warrants. I just have to have the time and, and, the, and the help to do it because I, I can't just walk into a house by myself. Uh, very unsafe. I usually have to bring a team with me. And if we do it the FBI style, we usually have about 15 people going in, so we're, we're plenty of reinforcements there. And. Uh, like Ron, I kind of touched on as far as what we're talking about for files here. These aren't just the 16, you know, pictures of 16-year-olds, 15-year-olds. Uh, a lot of these go down to babies, babies, toddlers. That's what these people are sharing out here. Is this just computers or cell phones? Do you pick up the cell phones or is it just 
it could be on either one. Yeah, I've, I've had some cases where this is all going on within, say, a tablet or even a, a cell phone. Yeah, anytime you have questions, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, Can you tell us oh. how are you detecting or what are you detecting? You're detecting images or, or transactions or what? Well, it's uh, it, well, images and videos that are being uh, sent across different networks. I, I try not to get too much into yeah. how we do it, so yeah. we don't. We don't. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to give away our techniques? Keith, yeah. I was joking when I talked about top security clearance. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> well, this isn't national security, but we, we, we try not to get our techniques out there too much. So otherwise, people get away from it. What do the different colors represent? Those are the different networks on there, the ne different networks we're monitoring. Uh, yeah, I don't have a time frame on it, but it is being video recorded today. Okay. So, and then we'll have conversation with speakers. There's editing. There's all kinds of stuff. But we will make these videos available as teaching segments as soon as we can. Okay. Okay. And as Jessica mentioned, I've uh, I personally started over. I think I'm actually getting close to a thousand right now. I just wasn't sure the exact number, and I didn't have time to look it up, but. Um, Getting close to 1,000 since 2005. Uh, 2005, when I started this, it was all a manual process. And since then, some very smart people uh, who know how to program have made some really good uh, programs for us to use that just automate everything. So, so if you, um, you mentioned that you have cost 15 warrants right now, and you look at this number, does that apply to the number of cases that you've investigated and initiated since 2005? That Oh, more out there than yeah. There's there's even more beyond what we're seeing here. Yeah, yeah. Then I'm also, you know, I also I also track even beyond Minneapolis. I'm, I'm basically watching the whole state. So whenever I can get a case, uh, if I can give a case to another agency, they're willing to take it. I will give it to them right away. And why do we why do we investigate these cases? Uh, I've had people say, well, it's just pictures. It's you know, it's. It's just a guy sitting in, you know, it could be a guy sitting in his uh, home just looking at pictures. He's not hurting anyone. A real great example here. Uh, this, is a, this is a case a few years ago on, on one of the programs I'm using. It, it uh, detected that there was child pornography being distributed from a, a fire station in Duluth. So I, I started working with uh, a Duluth investigator that I know up there. Uh, kind of basically narrowed it down to two people because of uh, I had like three three separate connections so we could actually form a, a you know rough time when this was going on. So this is one of the two guys that was that was working all three of those times. So uh, Duluth goes up, they do a search warrant in the firehouse when when this guy and the other guy are both working. Uh, this guy actually comes forward and he wants to make it so you know we don't bother you know. Police don't bother anyone else working in the firehouse. He, he takes the, the blame for it. And uh, he had a very large collection. I think he had, uh, well, he had one laptop at the firehouse. And I think he had at least three or four external hard drives in his, in his locker in the room that he had there. So he had a very large collection. So uh, I really credit the Duluth officer for doing this. She spent a lot of time on the case. She went through every single image and video on that on, on his devices. If she hadn't done that, she wouldn't have known that this guy was producing images with his four-month-old four niece. So, yeah, where um, where some agencies, they, I mean, even though we're not supposed to, just given the time, they might they might stop when they have enough enough to charge the guy. In this case, if if they had done that, they would have had you know he would have had a a pretty pretty normal state charge for this guy, and he would have probably gotten probation, uh, that, that sort of thing with, with the state charge, just because he's a first-time offender. But instead, uh, with, with him producing images, um, the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, and the, you know, the, the federal government, uh, they, have, they have a lot tougher prosecution with these cases. So I, I've been... Uh, getting cases to the U.S. Attorney's Office since probably about 2007. And these guys do take a hit with that. 
So this guy, he obviously is a firefighter. He has no previous, um, no prior criminal history or anything. Uh, we got him, he ended up getting, I believe it was 17 years for, for this, for production with the federal government. Uh, even production within the state, I would be shocked if you get anywhere even near that much. And in the, in the, uh, in the federal system, they don't get to, uh, there's no, you don't get out with half time. You know, they'll get out on probation. Federal time, you do 90% of the time. Then they start transitioning you out. So it's none of this early release stuff. So he's, uh, so he's gonna be well, he's gonna be, uh, he's gonna be in prison well into the, after I retire. So that's, uh, I, I consider that a good thing. Okay, why, oh yeah, why, what, what's the state versus federal prosecution? I, I always like to touch on this because I, I, I believe our state sentencing and our state laws are very weak in this area. So I'm just gonna talk, I'll just kind of walk through a few different cases that I've prosecuted over the years. Uh, this gentleman lived down in Burnsville. He's a first time offender. Uh, he, he both admitted to distribution and possession. And he, uh, as I remember right, he had, he's into the thousands of files that were found on his computer. 30 days in jail. So probably just a few weekends he spends in jail. Then he's on probation for five years. Uh, this, is one of the first, uh, this is one of the first chat investigations I worked. Um, went up, uh, oh yes. On that last image, uh, wouldn't he be a registered sex offender forever? No, it's typically not forever. Uh, you just see them, they get about 10 years on the sex offender registry. And at that point, they, even though they're off the registry, their, their name still stays in the registry, just it's not active anymore. So uh, this gentleman, he was with the Coast Guard up in Duluth. He actually came down and met with us at the, at the Mall of America and got himself arrested down there. And he, he believed he was, he was gonna be meeting a real 14-year-old uh, girl down there. We even went into his hotel, searched his car. So he brought, brought stuff with him, even a camera. So he gets 120 days, three years probation. This gentleman up in the, uh, the Anoka area, so he's a first time offender. Uh, I believe he had a few, at least a few thousand files on his computer. 25 days, five years probation. Kind of seen a trend here. It's always, always about the same numbers. This gentleman, same way, he lived in Minneapolis with his parents. Um, yeah, 90 days in the workhouse, 30, three years probation. This is actually the one atypical one in, in state, state court, especially with uh, Hennepin County. Uh, you know, this guy has a very unique look. He liked Marilyn Manson, so he's trying to make himself look that way. But um, yeah, he, he was a, uh, he's also a first time offender. Uh, this guy, he kind of went beyond what they, kind of a normal case. This was a, this was a lead I got in. He was actually uh, sending child pornography to a online sex worker who was in Las Vegas. She was very good and reported all this and we were able to track him down because he was actually saying he was abusing a child right then as he was, as he was sending the images to her. So um, he actually got 30, uh, yeah, 30 months in prison and five years probation. Yeah, I think that's what kind of got the sentence a little higher in his case. But that, yeah, that's very, that's, that's not a normal sentence for, uh, for state court. As you remember, I just had this guy's picture up a few slides ago. Uh, within three months of me doing the search warrant on this gentleman, he starts reoffending from his parents' house again, using the same exact system he was using before. Not, not a real rocket, science here, rocket scientist here. So I was actually busy with other cases, so I just kept watching him for about a year. I kept just collecting all the data coming from his, his parents' house, you know, enough for uh, a search warrant. So um, after he was convicted, and he was actually um, uh, started to do sex offender treatment, he was still doing it, he still kept doing it. Uh, so I did a second search warrant on his parents' house, and this time he, he thought he was gonna be smart, he was, gonna, he, was all, he was doing it all from a tablet. And he had the tablet, actually he was sitting on the pillow in his, in his room in his parents' house. He was living off uh, uh, down in another city with his uh, girlfriend who's a teacher. So um, once I did the search warrant there, um, found the only, only thing I ran into was the tablet that I found it on, it was locked. It, it, was, it had a passcode lock, I couldn't, I didn't know the code, I didn't have any software that could get through it. 
Uh, I was able to get his probation revoked. Uh, he should have gone back to, j back to jail for 15 months. The judge gave him 120 days. Again, I don't know why, again, why be weak when someone's clearly reoffending? It's not, it's not showing, it's not uh, sending a good signal. Um, after, after he got that very light sentence, I was kind of annoyed. So I went back to my office. I, I, took, I, I took out his tablet. I pulled up any single, every single number I could find that was, you know, any of his biographical information. I punched in the last four digits of his social security number. Boom, it opens up. Uh, now I have a new case. He had uh, like 3,000 images on that tablet. So, because I don't want him to get another uh, light sentence in state, in uh, state court, because even a second time offender in Minnesota, there is no presumptive sentence. There's nothing that tells the judge to give them a certain amount of time. Uh, on the flip side, in the federal side, for a repeat offender who is either receiving or distributing child pornography, it's a 15 year mandatory minimum. The judge, no matter what, the, if the judge doesn't like it, they cannot go below 15 years. And he also got the 15 years probation. So after he does his 15, you know, he'll probably do, around, I suppose, around 13 and a half or so years. He comes out, he's gonna be monitored for the next 15 years. So, um, very, very good sentence there. I do, yeah. If I if I can you know, if I can present a case to the U.S. Attorney's Office and they'll take it, then that, that's the first thing I'll go with. Yep. Again, we just saw this gentleman too, um, a few slides back. He uh, say he got, he got the, the, the harsher sentence uh, in state court. Uh, what he does is he's going through treatment, or actually, in fact, actually, I think he's waiting to get into treatment. He goes and gets himself a computer he shouldn't have. And then he, he uh, goes on to different uh, uh, chat networks and befriends some girls on there and gets them to send videos or do videos of themselves with him, live videos. And he records it using the same program he also had on his prior, in his, in, on his, the computers in his prior case. So he ends up having three victims there. And uh, nicely as he recorded the screen, he actually recorded himself in the upper right hand corner, in the upper corner of the screen. So you get to see everything he's doing too. So he, really, he has no defense here. So um, with a second time offender, and, and, he, and he actually got held uh, responsible for producing those videos. He asked the girls to, to, to do this stuff in the videos. So he gets uh, the, mandatory, uh, the mandatory sentence for a, a second timer who produces is 25 years, and he's on probation for the rest of his life. So again, very, very good sentence. He's gonna be in jail for a very, very long time. This guy, he, uh, first time uh, he's, a, he's a, uh, possessing in state court, gets a fairly light sentence, this, and then uh, I get him on the second time for distri distributing, 15 years mandatory minim minimum, and then he's 20 years probation. And this guy, we just got going through, we just got done with a trial with him. Uh, he was abusing his girlfriend's eight-year-old brother and taking pictures of it, and uh, in this case, Hennepin County, they, they initially arrested him. Hennepin County actually let him out on bond, even though he uh, is not of this country. Um, and then, uh, so then HSI, or uh, ICE picks him up. They're about to deport him. So I, 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 I got, that whole thing stopped. I got a, I got a uh, federal warrant to arrest him. I pulled him out of ICE detention, and then we, uh, put him through the federal system. So even though he's a first time offender, had you know, no criminal history that we know of, he got 20 years in prison for that. And then once he's done doing his prison time, he will be deported. And he, I would say he'd be very likely to, if, if we had just let him be deported, he probably would have abused a, a kid down in a, you know, the country where he came from. So. Now, the uh, reason why I'm talking a lot about the, um, uh, the sentencing here, this, uh, a report came out, I think, in the last year or two. If you can go, you go to that website down there, it actually talks about uh, Minnesota's light sentencing on these cases. And uh, after, actually, after reading it, and you know, I, I already knew about what, what it was like with the uh, child pornography cases, I didn't know what it was like with uh, criminal sexual conduct cases involving children. Again, very, very similar, where they're not, in my opinion, in just my personal opinion, they're not getting, people are not getting enough jail time for this. 
give you a minute to write that down if you want it. This is just one, uh, one uh, just snippet out of that report. So just 65% of offenders who were um, involved in a, in a child uh, sexual crime, they do not get any prison time. So one, one of the things I would personally like to see is just that we, Minnesota moves a little bit more like some other states. I think, uh, I think it was Illinois that I last heard Illinois has actually kind of moved their laws and their sentencing very, you know, much closer to what um, the federal system has. In fact, uh, from what I was told, uh, talking to some investigators down there, they, they rarely even use the federal system in that state just because their, their laws and their sentencing is, is, uh, is, is uh, kind of on, on par with what the, the federal system is. And even, uh, these are uh, just a, Again, this is a part of the report there too. It's just saying that there's, just showing that there's, there's no mandatory minimums, even for a first degree criminal sexual conduct case in Minnesota, there's nothing that tells the judge they have to give them any time. Yeah, go ahead. It varies with reports as far as reoffending. Um, again, this would be my opinion, but you know, given the number of repeat offenders I've come across, I would say it's very high. And that, the question I have is, since they know that the rate is so high, why do they do so little? That's, that's a good question. I, I, I would like to get something going where we, we do increase the sentences, where the judges have less discretion on this. Because it's, uh, I've seen many, many repeat offenders in, this, in this, uh, my time right here. And I think because uh, we're not catching them, we, we just haven't found the way they're doing it. Is there something we can do as citizens to, um, I don't know, get at the judges or get at the system, writing letters? Do you have any recommendations? Uh, I don't have all the details on how the whole system works, but it'd probably be uh, something within the, like a judiciary committee within the state would be where you'd want to start probably targeting letters to, um, where you want to see, you know, see some sentence, you know, mandatory minimum sentences in these cases. Um, yeah, just, uh, because yeah, there's, there's so much discretion, and, and I think even what I read in that report was even cases where parents abuse their own kids, they often do not see jail time. So I do not understand that. I mean, that, that's, that's the most trusted spot right there, and then you do not, you do not get any penalty for that. Okay, and then um, I'll move on to sextortion. Um, now, Ron kind of touched a little bit on the sexting here. This kind of ties into the sextortion. So what is it? What is sextortion? Usually it's um, someone trying to acquire even more images or videos of the, uh, of the target. Sometimes they will get, uh, try to get money. They'll use, uh, use these images to get money. And then uh, they also try to you know, meet up with the person to engage in some sort of uh, sexual conduct. Um, as I was starting to work a case I'm going to talk about in a few slides here, um, I, hadn't, I hadn't really run across anything with the money yet. I, I got a call from, it was either Brooklyn Center or Brooklyn Park Police. They had a case where a, uh, uh, I think it was a 13 or 14 year old boy reported that uh, he had sent images to someone and now they were asking for uh, the parents' credit cards, you know, give them all the numbers off the credit cards. So that's. And I, I never actually heard what happened with that case. I was so busy with the one I'm about to talk about that I didn't have time to help them out with that one. Uh, hopefully they were able to track down who this was. As far as victims, uh, from everything I've gathered at this point with the cases I've read about, it's about 50-50 for male and female. And they're around 15 years old. And uh, sextortion is a very uh, fast growing crime. And uh, again, due, the, due, due to the embarrassment involved in this crime, there, there, are, um, there are some suicides. Uh, I think Ron just talked about this one. This, um, this was an uh, investigation up in northern Minnesota. Uh, this gentleman uh, was contacting kids within his own school. 
believe there was some uh, sextortion going on there. And uh, you can see he got a, a 25 year term, so that's gonna be a, that's a federal, that's gonna be a federal sentencing there. You never see, be very rare to see that any time in Minnesota. And then uh, the case I was talking about with, that kept me so busy for about a year and a half here, this was uh, the United States versus Anton Martinenko. And I could actually talk about this case for a good two and a half hours. I have a really long presentation on the case from start to finish. Here's just a, couple, just a few of the highlights here. So this is just a number of agencies involved here. This is, uh, this is probably not everyone here. Um, so even Chaska was involved. They actually did one of the first search warrants on this case. And this was, uh, this was, our, uh, this was our suspect here. Mr. Martin Yanko is yeah, 31 years old, he's single. He uh, has a, a financial job not too far from where he lives. And one of the things we found out um, uh, as we went along is he liked to work out at Lifetime Fitness. He sometimes go around to about eight or nine different Lifetime Fitnesses all around the metro area in one day. And he normally timed it when there'd be uh, high school athletes there. So he, and he'd actually uh, be around the weightlifting equipment when they were. This too. is just some of the social media we know about that he used. There's around 40 different accounts that uh, we were able to, to locate. That was probably not all of them. And this is all his victims. They're all males. 15 to 18. And they were, you know, they're either going to be football, hockey, or lacrosse players. So like on the social media, he used that to match or figure out where they're going to be when that type of stuff? Or? If what we gathered, he would, he would normally find their names either uh, probably from the Lifetime Fitness or he would uh, find their names on sport, sports rosters and stuff where, you know, say the scores, you know, all their, all their stats and everything. And then he would try to find them on Facebook or wherever he might, wherever he can find them. So um, overall, once we did the search warrant, there ended up being, he had 300 different folders on different devices where he kept track of the victim's name, their age, and what school or city they lived in. And there's over 3,000 images. And as far as we could tell, the earliest time he had an image was about 2009. So he could have been doing it from about that time forward. And once we, uh, once we did all the work and figured out of those 300 different folders, uh, there ended up being 171 uh, minor victims in that time. Then once I put all the victims' addresses in, that's, that's kind of where they were spread out. Mostly around Minneapolis, but he, uh, for some reason, I don't know why, he even went down even into northern Illinois over here. He was, in fact, I, I went down, in, down there and interviewed one of the victims down there. But... Um, and yeah, the victims didn't know each other for the most part, except, you know, except for if they're in the same school. But uh, that's kind of where all those victims were spread out though. And he had two different uh, scams going. The first one he started off with was on Facebook. Uh, kind of like, uh, I think someone touched on, there's a, uh, the modeling. He, he, he basically came out and said he was a modeling agent. He had a, uh, he was uh, there's the, the main agent, Jake, and then he had uh, um, someone who was helping him named Courtney. So he would typically offer uh, money for, for modeling, $500, $700. So that, obviously that's uh, appealing to someone in high school if they can make some, you know, 500 bucks for doing, and this, and it's, it's gonna be hard to read in the back, but it says, you know, clothed, shirtless, or nude. But um, as we put that out there and he did get some, uh, he got quite a few responses. This is a photo that he put, this is Courtney. So, Obviously, to a 15-year-old, I can remember my days in high school. That would be uh, that would be very attractive to me. She's supposed to be in her early 20s. So um, he had several different Facebook accounts that he used. He had the ones that were you know the legitimate modeling ones. Then he also had other ones where uh, once he got the victim's photos, he would start to um, send those photos out to people in his high school. And then if um, and typically he'd be contacted by one of those victims saying, hey, stop it, this is not right. So then he'd try to get um, you know, either more nudes from that, or more nude images from that, uh, that victim or he would try to get uh, ones of other kids. You know, try to get you know, either names or, or images of other ones. And we ended up taking about, uh, I think there's like 4,000 pages of, ch of Facebook chat from just one of these accounts we had to go through. And it was just repeated of this stuff. He was just tormenting these victims over and over again. And just sending out their uh, images to all these people in the high school. And the majority of the people did not want to see these images. 
you know, why are you sending this to me? But he just kept sending them out repeatedly, tormenting these victims. And then the, uh, the second one he was using was a, he created a, uh, like a Twitter account with the name uh, Marie. He had about 150 images of this, of the same woman uh, that he would say that's who he was. And he would contact the victims on, uh, on Twitter, get them to send images of themselves, you know, say, oh, we'll meet up, we'll have sex, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and he ended up getting a, a, a very large amount of victims there. He got, he got the stuff, got the, uh, the images really quickly that way. This is just a, um, an excerpt of one of the chats. This is just before we caught him. Um, I ended up chatting with him about two days. I took over one of the victim's accounts once I found out that he was still active. This is actually after we did a search warrant on him. Within the next month, he was, he was back online doing it again. He could not stop. So I took over the, the uh, victim's account and uh, you can even see in the top line there, um, he's saying, oh, okay, deal, but uh, I'm not, uh, but if not, I'm sending uh, to gay porn sites in your school so everyone has your nudes. So he was, he was threatening, if I would, did not send him more images, he was gonna do that to, uh, to me. And actually, it wasn't me, this is, he, he actually still had the legitimate victim's uh, images. So uh, luckily in this, this line of chat here, he got arrested at, uh, 1620, right in between here. We, we busted into his house. So um, we stopped, as far as we know, we stopped him from sending any, any more images there. So, um, and he'd actually uh, reinforced his door at the time. He actually had two deadbolts on there. Took quite a while to smash through. And uh, like he did with his first search warrant, he'd actually, try, he'd actually destroyed evidence, or tried to destroy evidence in the first search warrant. He did the same thing in the second search warrant. But in the end, he did plead guilty uh, to production, um, production, distribution, and advertising. Each one is a 15-year mandatory minimum. And as we went through the list of victims, we did find out there had been two victims in this case who had committed suicide. We, we, I was able to talk to the mother of one of them. She, had no, she doesn't know if this was the contributing factor, but because the, the, unfortunately the victim had some uh, other he had actually made a prior suicide attempt, so obviously though this would not help. If you knew your images were out there, this would not help your, um, your mental well-being either. And I never could get a hold of the second victim's family. I tried as many times as I could, but I'm guessing they just didn't want, want any more contact on this. These are some of the um, uh, statements that some of the victims gave at sentencing. Can everyone read that? Do you want me to read that off in the back? Like the top one, as a result of this crime, I have to undergo therapy as well as attend inst inst institutionalized hospital from the, from the depression. To this day, I have a hard time trusting people. I don't use social media because there are more people out there like him. To say the least, I was mortified and was embarrassed to even walk into my own school. That was the worst part. Everything was out of my control. And I can only hope that someone would stop this monster. And say, with his guilty plea, he was sentenced uh, a while later, and he ended up getting 38 years. So, and he's, uh, he's actually trying to appeal this sentence, too. He thinks it's too high for everything he did. Okay, what apps are your kids using? <laughs> I, I do have a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old, so I am uh, constantly keeping track of what they're using, too. So these are, um, these are a lot of the different apps that I've uh, heard, of, heard of or seen in cases that I've been involved with. Um, as someone had talked about here, uh, you got Xbox Live. Uh, one, of the agent, the, one of the FBI agents I work with, she's working a case right now. We actually did the search warrant on the guy. Uh, but he was, he was communicating with all his victims through Xbox and they would get him to transition over to Skype or some, some other network like that. But he was getting uh, those victims to send nude photos of themselves too and then would uh, basically extort them for more, more, uh, more photos. So I actually just reluctantly gave my daughter access to Snapchat. I've seen so many cases of Snapchat. Uh, I didn't really agree with my, wife's, my wife on that one, but um, 
I, I also now have a Snapchat account that I can kind of keep a little bit better track of hers. But uh, I, I do go on to her phone once in a while. I have the code for it, and I can take a look around and see what's going on there, too. Obviously, if you delete stuff, I'm not going to see it all. But um, yeah, so there's so many different apps out there. There seems to be a new one coming out every, every few weeks, every month. Something, something new pops up. I, on one of the law enforcement uh, email lists I'm on, someone's always posting something, hey, has anyone heard of this app? Like, no, most of us haven't. There's always something new out there. So um, yes, one of the things I do, at least with my kids, is to stop them from just putting any app that they want on there. Since they're, they're tied into my iTunes account, I control what goes on their phones. So they cannot put any app on there without me uh, first knowing about it. I have to put, the, I have to put a passcode in for them to, to know that. Okay, I wouldn't stop them from going to, you know, uh, going to a website and creating an account on uh, somewhere, you can still do that. There's, basically, there's ways around everything if you're, if, you're, uh, if you're motivated enough. So one of the things you can do, I, I try to do this uh, very often. Usually, a lot of times when a, when a new case pops up in my, uh, and I'm working at uh, work, we should talk about a little bit of that at the dinner table. <laughs> Embarrasses the heck out of my daughter, too. I was like, oh, would you send nude photos? No, 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 I would never do that. But um, yeah, so I, I try to talk about some of these cases. I, I don't go into all the, the gruesome details, but I, I certainly talk about uh, some of the stuff going on. You know, she always promises me she'll let me know if there, you know, any, anything inappropriate comes across her phone. But I'll always be looking too, to see. Yeah, and then yeah, a lot of you know, like I, like I do, I, I talk a lot about the cases. I talk about you know, even things you see in the news. You can you can talk about that. You know, if you're you know, even if they become aware of something that's happening to anyone else, you know, let me know about it. I'll I'll get involved. I'd say with uh, like my daughter getting uh, Snapchat here re recently, I went in and helped her set all the privacy settings, so she only communicates with. As far as we know, are her friends, and um, what I know, I think a lot of her yeah, her circle of friends has uh, had, had uh, Snapchat. So everything we said on there is limited to just that. So um, yeah, like with Facebook, yeah, it's just you know, if you're just out there where anyone can see you or see any of your information, then you're you're just more exposed to the general public. So hey, you know, um, in, in, in Rogers talking earlier about. Uh, Oh, yeah. that it happened, but, but also kind of the, the forecasting and setting the example as a parent as they come into spring break. So, so many parents say, yeah, we're at the airport now, we're leaving for a week. Oh. <laughs> and, and so your house is empty. And then, yeah. and then the kids forecasting where they're going to be. Yep. So, uh, yeah, even, uh, yeah, you know, we were in Hawaii a couple years ago. Yeah, my daughter was putting Instagram of, of Hawaii. Well, we're obviously not at home anymore, yeah. are we? Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, that's yeah, stuff to think about there, too. And this is some uh, signs of grooming that's going on, you know, or if grooming is going on, of, uh, if, if they're in contact with someone, you know, receiving, obviously receiving gifts in the mail, if someone's sending your kid a phone, obviously that's a huge red flag. I think we'd all recognize that one. Um, as being aware, if, if they're actually making any phone calls, I, I doubt, like uh, Ron said, that there's any phone calls going on, it's mostly texting. And then, um, yeah, you know, they're spending a lot of time online. I mean, my, my, da my daughter's always on her phone. I, it, it bugs the heck out of me. But, um, but uh, yeah, if they're so, you know, will, will not step away from that phone, then it's time to probably take it away for a while. But, uh, yeah, just, uh, just being aware of what's going on on the screen. I mean, my, my son's even done that a few times. He's, he's uh, flipped off the screen real quick or, you know, he starts try, trying to delete his history. And, you know, I grab it right away and... Actually, he wasn't into anything bad. I mean, that's, that, was, that was actually a good thing when I started looking. But, uh, <laughs> but he was just embarrassed about looking at, uh, he, was, he was looking at some uh, cartoon art or something like that. But it wasn't pornographic or anything. I don't know why he was uh, doing that. But um, yeah, so yeah, just uh, yeah, be aware of what's on the screen there. Uh, I know my house, I, 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 got, I got a system called uh, Open, it's, it's from a company called Open DNS. It, uh, it just prevents um, anyone using your internet connection to go off to any sites that you don't already approve, so you kind of set what's, what it can go to. So if you try to go to a pornographic site from my, ne my home network, you're not getting there. It'll, it'll block it right away. Uh, obviously, the only thing that, you know, if, if, if a kid has a cell phone, 
They just turn off the Wi-Fi, they're on the cell phone network. You have no control anymore. That's, that's the one bad thing with cell phones. They always they can kind of get around everything. Except for with the monitoring software that uh, someone pointed out here. And like Ron said, yeah, establish rules. Uh, in my house, uh, the internet cuts off at a certain time of day for all of my kids' devices. I can control when, the, when, that, when those devices get on the internet. So at a certain time of night, like on uh, school nights, 10 o'clock, all their devices stop working, except for their cell phone, which, they, which stays in, uh, in the downstairs, doesn't go up to their rooms. And then, um, yeah, kind of, again, like we talked about, yeah, who do they talk to? What are they doing online? Yeah, my, my kids do not take their computers or cell phones up to their rooms. It's always down in the, in the common areas of the house where you can at least see what they're, they're doing there. But yeah, overall, just yeah, monitor what they're, what's, uh, what's on their phones, what, what they're using. A little early, but uh, anything, uh, any questions you want to talk about? Or, or, oh, yeah. Um, I saw the parents that are working hard at monitoring their kids' devices, but it was recently brought to my attention that there's like a telephone system that they can call the calculator app where a kid can type in the code and then it goes into another app. Do you know that's already Actually, a trial I just had, the, uh, the suspect in that trial was using the calculator app on his phone to store images. Um, yeah, it, it, it looks just like a calculator as soon as you press the app. It'll come up with a, a passcode. You type in the code, and then you can store images inside that inside that uh, application. Not the one I've seen. I, I haven't seen any communication there. But you um, you can definitely store stuff away. Um, unfortunately, though, for I mean, for the forensic software I have at my uh, office, it it doesn't stop it from it doesn't actually do anything to encrypt it or anything. It's it's still visible to my software when I when I examine the phone. Yep. Uh, the level of evidence is, you know, pretty much the same. Um, as far as from the uh, the officer or the agent working it, there's just more time involved because you you worked really closely with the the attorney in the case. Um, you know, like like the one that just went to trial. I think that was the last the last guy um, that I had up there. Um, yeah, I, I was working. I was in the trial the entire time from the time we're picking the jury all the way through the end. So you uh, you help out and do whatever you need to there. Uh, for the for the entire length of the case, uh, which some some uh, agency, especially a smaller agency, would probably have a little bit of trouble with that, having their investigator gone for you know a week at a time for doing all this investigation or, or helping with the the trial. Yep, go ahead. Well, uh, only talk to your friends, the like the ones you actually you actually know, the ones you meet with. Yeah, if anyone else comes online that says they want to be your friend and you've never heard of them, do not do not uh, communicate with them. Because like with the the Anton Martinenko case, none of those victims there, even though they were, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old, they didn't know this person. They didn't even know if that was a real girl or not. They 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 they. they, they look, excuse me. To me, uh, to them, it probably it was very tempting. You know, hey, it's a 21 year old girl. I could I could hang out with this 21 year old girl. She's really beautiful and everything. Um, they just didn't think about, well, why is she contacting me? And, you know, it's just a little bit too, too good to be true. So, yeah, that, that'd be the big thing. That's only, only communicate with your real friends. All those dots on the map, clearly there's too many for you to go after, but yet they're all illegal. So what, what does it take to bubble it up? I mean, is it just the frequency, or do you have to find something even more serious to go after? Oh, but which, 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 which one of those cases? Yeah. Uh, yeah, generally I look for uh, a prior offender is the first thing I do. I, I kind of find everyone that I, I can find. You know, I, I, I you know, look up the address, I find out who's living there, and I'll try to figure out is there a prior offender there that I, that's identified. If, that, if there's one there, that's the top of the list. Then I'm trying to also do, I guess, very time consuming to do checks on the addresses too. Well, is there a school teacher that lives there? Is there a police officer that lives there? A firefighter? Uh, obviously, if you know, anyone in a, pers a position of trust, that's, that's also very high on the list. And then, um, like, uh, actually, right now, I think I have one who's, uh, say he's like an outdoor, basically, he takes youth on outdoor trips. 
So, so he's now at the top of my list. I'll be hopefully hitting him in a couple weeks here with a search warrant, not actually hitting him. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, be, yeah, hitting his house. So uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in some of those cases, the, the people keep reoffending, so I, I can keep tracking them, um, and then I hopefully we'll get to them. But um, yeah, as far as just a general list, we can't, we can't just say, you know, you know, Bill over at that house over there. He's, you know, there's been stuff coming from his house because we, we don't know who did it because it could be could be him, could be his son, could be someone visiting him. You don't you don't know what happened there until you actually go in and, and check it out. Yep. Oh, it's about uh, school devices like iPads or Chrome or laptops that the school gives the students for, for school. Yeah, whether they're monitored or not. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I would, I'd have to guess very little from what I would gather. Because, I mean, if you have a, a high school with 2,500 students, I can't imagine there's anyone keeping track of what everyone's doing on there. I do not have that in my kid's school, so. Yeah, like <laughs> be... the same, uh, and they will shut your iPad down if you go on the wrong site and try to search the wrong thing. Oh, nice. Uh, and then take their iPads away and then you can notify the parents. So. Yeah, so yeah, some, some schools are keeping up with it. I guess others are not, though. Uh, yep. Oh, okay. So, I mean, you can save pictures, but the school had access to other <coughs> devices, so it's just, you know, well, ho Hopefully my kids' uh, school's like that. I haven't, I haven't heard either way, though. Uh, yep, in the back. Okay. Okay, I guess there's more of that out there than I knew about. Hmm. Oh, out of time? Okay, uh, maybe one more question and then we'll have to move on. Right, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, there's always a way around almost any security that you can come up with. Even that, uh, what I have at my home, you can easily, you can, you can circumvent that if you know how to do it. So. Oh, yeah, yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, you you've had your hand up for a few, a few times. Go ahead.
Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, you, even though you want, you, know, you ultimately want them to learn, you can't you can't keep monitoring software on, on their on de you know devices for the next twenty years, even though they're adults. You can't do that. They have to learn to do it themselves. So, well, thanks for listening and. Thank you.